for joining us here today at the uh, BMI Coverland uh, virtual launch, something new, a, a South African first. Um, not only is it a, a South African first when it comes to the product itself, but also to this event today. Um, just a little bit of quick housekeeping before we get going. Um, I'm sure most of you are very comfortable on the Zoom platform. Um, the down at the bottom of your screen you will see a box that says uh, chat if you click on that you'll be able to send us your questions and which we will tackle during the course of the morning um, we are looking at starting up now running through to around quarter past ten um, the running order of the day is this morning up first is dr franz crenier who's going to be discussing with us a daunting topic, the rise and fall of South Africa. Um, the information that is uh, supplied and put together is, is done through data that is accumulated from the behavior of those of us at the, at the polls, um, economic and social behavior, and it makes for a very interesting um, and informative discussion um, as a business owner. Um, it gives you some inside advice. Uh, what you've seen at the moment quickly is a poll come up. We would appreciate it if you would participate in our polls. You simply click on the on your selection and and uh, and then the red red corner in the poll will then uh, move away. Um, followed direct after Dr. France, uh, we're going to be show, talking about this new uh, launch and the new offer by BMI. And we're very excited to have um, Hanali van der Valt, um, who heads up the uh, Sub-Saharan and African divisions of BMI Cloverland. And, uh, and then uh, we're going to play the uh, new video and, uh, and we'll have a Q&A session at the end of the morning um, with uh, where we can answer any of your questions. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Franz Krunier. And uh, yes, Dr. Franz, take it away. Louise, thank you very much. Uh, good morning to all your guests. South African Think Tank and Risk Advisory Group this half an hour or so is to talk you through where we believe South Africa and the world are headed in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic. You should be seeing my uh, screen, the rise or fall of South Africa, or is the big and operative word in all of this. About half an hour from now, I hope that I've been able to give you some answers. The order of things from me in the next half an hour is going to be as follows. We're going to start in the rest of the world. South Africa is a small little boat afloat in a big and increasingly tempestuous global sea. What's the world's outlook? And a heads up there, it's going to be more positive than I think you're going to get from the bulk of the analyst community here or around the world for quite some time yet. From there into South Africa, a window into its politics, its economy, its labor market, education, the question of energy and ESCOM in the week of load shedding. And from there, the scenarios. What do we think are the possibilities for South Africa now? And when we work down from those, what do we think the probability is? And later this morning, uh, you'll have the opportunity to put some questions to us. Let's start in the rest of the world. And the data is extraordinary. The chart you're looking at here shows much of global GDP. It's the G20. And that was the economic growth outlook for the G20 pre-COVID. They were all in positive territory except for the Argentines. And a couple of months later, this is what the world looks like now. And things have been turned on their heads. South Africa's growth figure, negative 8.2. That is a bit uh, further south than what the finance minister put out. Uh, two weeks ago. That's our figure. And uh, it's based on the fact that uh, Treasury forecasts for South Africa have tended to be somewhat off the mark over the past uh, decade or so. 
As growth levels uh, fell around the world, uh, budget deficits expanded. Uh, this is the 2019 deficit position of uh, most major uh, global economies and one or two out of, out of Africa as well, Nigerians together with South Africa. That was 2019. This is the present position. And it's an amazing reversal. For most of these economies, though, these deficits are going to be a tangential dot on the chart, uh, and they'll go back to their long-term deficit trajectories next year. The question on South Africa is, given the fragility with which it entered this crisis, is it going to wallow in deeper levels of deficit for longer than is going to be the case for its emerging market peers? As growth shrunk and deficits expanded, uh, the debt levels of governments around the world took off as well. That's the 2019 position. Government debt is a share of GDP for, for most uh, serious uh, parts of the world in South Africa and Nigeria. This is the debt position now, uh, mostly up around the 20 percentage points or so. That's exactly what's happened in South Africa. The 81.8% is a treasury forecast. And have a little bit of caution around that one, given the fact that Treasury growth figures, their forecasts haven't been a spot on for the past a decade. As economies shrank, deficits expanded, debt levels went up, unemployment rose around the world as well. The 2019 like with like comparison of unemployment rates for a very as extensive cross section of countries. The 2020 position, and there's a skyscraper, that's South Africa. We see that one leaping up to just under 40%. We'll see in Stats SA data how close we were on that later in the year. And the 2021 position. And the great question that starts to be asked of South Africa now is, given its relative fragility, does COVID prompt the long-awaited structural reform agenda? that's necessary to put South Africa back on track to meet the country's great potential. Around the world, though, we think the recovery has already begun. Since uh, uh, probably early March, we were saying in client notes that we put out on Monday mornings that we're far more upbeat about global prospects than what the bulk of the analyst community was then and remains now. And there are reasons for that. Start with PMI data. PMIs are purchasing managers' indices that are a great measure of sentiment in economies. In May, this was the PMI data for countries from the United States through to Australia. And if you're an analyst that deals in this, you'll know these numbers are also extraordinary. In living analyst memory, we've not seen PMIs down at these levels. In June, however, the rebound is more than 10 percentage points across the board. Expansion again. We knew this was going to down early on. Its PMI rebounded very strongly back to that 50 points mark. And an insight into the global economy that's, that's now something to ponder is to think that for the past four months, Chinese PMI figures have been higher than for the corresponding period last year. As PMIs rebounded, we see the corroboration for a global recovery in commodity prices. You're looking on this chart at everything from copper through to coal. Copper back to above uh, January levels, a huge rebound from the low points in March. Gold does odd things during crises, so you just leave gold where it is. Platinums come back strongly from March. Iron ore and coal are both back above January levels. Oil is fighting its way upwards. And remember, a lot of that crash in the oil price in March was not COVID. That was the Saudis and the Russians fighting with each other. And a favorite in the Center for Risk Analysis is the Baltic Dry Index. It measures the price of shipping bulk dry goods around the world. And it has come back very, very strongly. Always a great canary on what is really going on in the global economy. Further, why we're positive about the global recovery is we think, and this is a very bold call, that COVID is coming to an end. 
The chart you're looking at here runs from December last year into about 24 hours ago. And it is the daily change in new COVID infections around the world. That center part of the chart, that steep takeoff, we're not going to see a repeat of that. What you're seeing in the latter parts of the chart appears to be a second wave. It's reported as that in the media. We don't think it is that. We think it's other things. It's jurisdictions that missed the first peak that are now going through their peaks. And it's people in the Western world going back to work and being tested for COVID and being found to be positive but asymptomatic. And we know that's explaining this rise towards the end because the average age of COVID-infected people in somewhere like the United States that has such good data has been falling uh, over the past several weeks. To really hammer home that point, uh, Becky, my colleague on this call with me this morning, created these uh, fantastic charts. They, they're the COVID picture for various countries around the world from December last year into you know, 24 hours ago. The red lines that have come up on your charts are the daily change in new infections. And the pattern broadly around the world is now understood by good analysts. It is essentially that within a hundred, within 60 days of your hundredth case as a country, you get very near to reaching your peak. And after reaching that peak, the pandemic washes out of your society. And our sense now is that you continue with some social distancing protocols, carrying a low viral load until a, a vaccine comes along. But there won't be, be surge second wave. Look to the top right and you think, well, you know, am I right? Because look at the American numbers. They are showing what seems to be a second wave. We don't think that's it. Uh, put up a second uh, indicator, COVID deaths over time. And look what's happened in America. The, in the second wave, so-called wave of infections, has not triggered a commensurate increase in deaths. And the reason is these are people going back to work and being tested and found to be positive. They're younger people. They're not going to die of COVID-related infections. If we're right on this, we think that COVID is largely over for the world. And if that is correct, and you take our positive read out of commodity prices and PMIs, we can begin to start to look forward to a steep V global recovery. What can, what can uh, 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 undermine that? Well, if, if confidence in stimulus measures collapses, that can undermine it. Or if a second new geostrategic threat washes through the world, uh, nukes in North Korea, the Straits of Hormuz, uh, India and uh, China trade wars, that can undo it. But from a COVID perspective, our call now to clients is that the worst is over. The quick segue to South Africa is the worst over in South Africa, yet we think our peaks are pretty much there. This is the number of daily confirmed cases for South Africa uh, from uh, uh, March into you know, a couple of days ago. And this is the number of daily confirmed deaths. We think now in parts of the country, particularly in the Western Cape, the data is going to show that the peak has already been reached. peak into June, end of June, reach peaks uh, into August, but then South Africa is in its spring and the, the worst of the viral pandemic for our country will be over. Staying in the global world, the biggest event of the year and a huge impact on South Africa and everywhere else is the election in America. What, who's going to win, Trump or Biden? Our latest estimates are that Trump is uh, trailing Biden by 30 electoral college votes. The college determines the presidency in America, not the popular vote. In the, in the non-swing states, the states that are always Republican or Democrat, uh, Trump has a little advantage now over Mr. Biden. But in the swing states, the states that are hard to call, Biden is far ahead of Mr. Trump. Can Mr. Trump still win is the question clients ask us. Absolutely is the answer. You're looking at Michigan there, Florida below it, Pennsylvania, three important swing states. Michigan has 16 electoral college votes. If that turns to Trump, 
He's got enough now. Biden loses 16 votes. Trump gets them back. He wins. Florida, the same. Pennsylvania, the same. These are the same states that allowed him to uh, nudge out uh, Hillary Clinton four years ago. So our view on the world is COVID's largely coming to an end. The global economy, relative to the horror stories cast around the world, is going to show a much stronger recovery. And against that context, what is going to happen with us? Start with our politics in South Africa. The best single chart to understand that is this one. 1994 to 2019, the first thing I show you, these gray bars, are South Africa's rate of economic growth. Strong recovery from 94 into 2007. Between 2004 and 7, we're averaging a growth rate of 5%. The first time we've done that as a country for four consecutive years since 1970. But the last decade of Mr. Zuma and the global financial crisis will change the outlook and growth will trail away. As that happened in that last decade, service delivery efforts began to stagnate and living standards with them. The orange line that you're looking at is the proportion of families in South Africa that did not have electricity. And on coming to power in 1994, the ANC inherited a country where 50% of families did not have electricity. And 10 years later, in 2004, that's 20%. And for all you read on Twitter and newspapers about service delivery efforts that are rightly criticized, the macro view is that there are very few emerging markets that can compete with some of the successes achieved here in the first decade of democracy in raising the basic living standards of poor people. Next level of data on this uh, chart is this black dotted line. It's a poll. Are you confident in the future of South Africa? And on the back of that Mbeki era of relative high growth and going into the financial crisis, 60% of South Africans said they were still confident. That's now fallen to 20%. As confidence falls, we see support for the ANC starting to tail off as well. Look to the middle of the chart, 2004. The ANC is six percentage points stronger than when Mandela had led the country to freedom in 1994. The reason for that, as ever, is that life was getting better in South Africa. ANC voters do not vote on liberation loyalty. They're just the same as any voter anywhere else in the world. They vote on what they perceive to be their best interests. And when life stopped getting better, support for the ANC started to tail off alarmingly. In conjunction with that, the last level of data on South African politics, protest action. In 2010, that little square, the red square, read it off the left-hand axis, shows that 9% of protests in the country were violent. By 2018, that had risen to about 30%. It's not that South Africans became violent, they became frustrated at the political choices they faced. And if you offer them a better choice or a reformist choice, our polling is pretty clear that they'll back that very strongly. And whoever puts out the the sort of best reform offering now, there's a very good chance of running away with governing South Africa by the end of this decade. Everything hinges as always on the economy, as that political chart suggested, and here the story is a complex one. I take you back to 1979, the data is projected into 2019, and it's South African GDP per capita as an average of the world. As, as a proportion of the world's average. So lastly, it was last in the late 70s that we were on a par with the world. One, one to one was the income, the G. Apartheid is catastrophic as South Africa gets rid as then of the tiger economies and of China. ANC takes over in 1994. The Asian crisis uh, undermines their efforts slightly in 98 and 99. But then an amazing thing happened. It's a subtle little curve in the chart, but its implications are, are great. From around 99 to 2007, 2008, 9, South Africa became richer relative to the average of the world. And that is an achievement that I don't think South Africans properly appreciate and one that a 
profoundly fundamental strategy of policy reform to see the country replicate through the rest of this decade and into the 2030s. Putting ever more pressure on reform, the finance minister says it almost every day, is that the government is now running out of money. 1913 to 2020, this is South Africa's budget deficit. And the figures uh, for this year, uh, that uh, amazing deficit figure of around negative 15%, deeper than anything we've recorded, deeper than what happened in the volatile 1980s, deeper than what happened in the, in, the, in the Second World War. And to find anything comparable to that, you actually need to go back to the First World War. Running out of money is a great means to focus the mind. doesn't matter who you are. And if there's one uh, sort of inflection point from which structural reform in South Africa might now materialize, it is the fact that the cupboard, the fiscal cupboard, is increasingly a bear. Changing that means that the investment outlook for South Africa needs to improve. 1994 to 2020 is the data. It's fixed investment as a share of GDP. Uh, recovered strongly ahead of the Asian crisis, knocked back in the Asian crisis in 1999, recovered strongly a second time into 2007, knocked in the financial crisis uh, back down to 2010. And then through the last decade, we performed very, very poorly. Bring, around, bring about the right structural reforms now, and South Africa's outlook becomes very good. Those reforms are going to be needed to free South Africans from structural unemployment. The data on this chart runs again from 94 to 2020. We start with economic growth, that pattern now familiar to you from a previous chart. Uh, on, on top of that, and off the right-hand axis, the official number of people who are unemployed, and on top of that, the expanded number of people who are unemployed. And the point I want to make is one, this one. Look to the center of the chart to the expanded unemployment number, and you will see that the only period that saw a sustained decline in the number of people who were unemployed on that important expanded definition was when the South African economy breached the 5% growth mark. But do that again, and South Africa can erode its unemployment level down to below 10%, at 5% growth over a period of 15 to 20 years. Doing that requires getting our schools right, and, and here the, the picture is not uh, good at all. What my analyst colleagues have done is they've taken the grade one class of 2007, all the kids that sat together on day one in grade one, and they tracked them over the next 12 years through their school careers to see what happened to them. And, and the picture, I warned you, is rough. 1.2 million kids, that's the far left-hand bar as you look at your screens, 1.2 million kids enrolled in grade one in 2007. The second bar is grade 10 in 2016 and 1.1 million kids are still there. It's 10 years later, it's the same cohort. They're mostly there, we've done well. But between grade 10 in 2016 and grade 12 in 2018, we lost 500,000 children who dropped out of the education system. Of those, only 400,000 would go on to pass their matric exams, 200,000 nominally well enough to go to university, and 50,000 or 4% of the total passed maths and matric. It is an easy problem to fix because we don't have a resource constraint on education. What we spend in terms of dollars or shares of GDP or whatever is perfectly in line with emerging markets that produce great results in school. Bring about the right uh, structural, I mean, the right education policy reforms, mainly through giving parents and communities more control of what happens in their schools. And there's no reason that we can't double the number of kids passing maths and matric every five years for the next uh, 20 years. That takes us on. Bottleneck exists, but one that can also be beaten. 2020 and it shows you the monthly change in the volume of electricity generated and uh, distributed uh, in our uh, country. 
The data is flirting with the, with the zero. Let me go back there. Sorry. The data is flirting with the zero percent mark for most of the period into early 2018, where after it turns negative, we're producing less. And uh, then the sharp dip in production, a, a reflection of demand into March and May. Now the lights are off in the middle of a, of a recession. And that's an alarming thing. But this can be fixed. And the fix is also fundamental reform. You've got to break up Eskom. You've got to sell its generating capacity. You've got to put the grid into the hands of a new parastatal. And you've got to float the price and let private providers, even on a very small scale, into the market. And if South Africa does that, it has a chance of generating sufficient capacity in order to hike that growth rate to 5% by the end of this decade. <laughs> So I've said the global context, and I've said our outlook is uh, pretty on much on the upside for the world. I've said the South African context, and I've said that the inflections and pressures for reform are not going to be greater than they are at the moment. And from there, I go to the scenarios themselves. What do we think is going to happen? Put very simply, we think that now depends on two sets of, of questions. The first set of question is, what is the public demand for reform going to be? Will there, and public is a broad concept, it means organized business, it means civil society, the media, institutions, prominent individuals, etc. Will there be a massive demand for the right kinds of reforms, or will people to become indifferent or perhaps even oppose reform? And while that plays itself out in the sort of public square, what does the state itself do? Will the long-awaited reform agenda that Mr. Ramaphosa was hoped to bring with him to the union buildings materialize, or will it peter out into nothingness? How those uh, uh, fact questions are answered over the next 10 years on that matrix uh, uh, creates four quadrants, and each of those quadrants is a potential direction South Africa could move in, and they are our scenarios. The top right quadrant, Demands for massive uh, reform uh, relate, uh, 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 translating to reform being triggered is a scenario for South Africa that we call the rise of South Africa. And if that one plays out, you're about to see this. COVID's going to trigger the long-awaited structural reforms. Um, property rights, there'll be no question of investor uh, certainty. Uh, significant labor market deregulation prices poor people into work. Empowerment is turned on its head, gets a socioeconomic basis, and does what it's meant to do, accelerating poor people into the middle classes. Parastatals and the likes are sold where they can't uh, pre perform, and we are certainly not trying to start an airline. Economically, what's going to happen is South Africa is going to recover strongly out of COVID in line with the steep uh, global uh, recovery V that, that we anticipate through the short to medium term. Debt and deficit levels will flatten out into 2024. They'll fall into 2029. The currency is going to find a flaw. It's going to strengthen relative to the dollar into 2029. And that, together with South Africa's recovery, how's this for a bold call? That, uh, with South Africa's recovery, the currency is, is going to see the Aussie, the South African market, stand out as the star outperforming stock market of the next decade. Unemployment will be at 15% by 2029. The number of kids passing maths and matric has gone straight up. Living standards improving at a rate that we last saw between 1994 and 2004. We've remained a free society. ANC support is stabilized at above 60%. The reformers have the upper hand. The state capture chaps are prosecuted out of the running. And South Africa is a bastion of liberty and prosperity in the world. The second scenario is bottom right. What happens here if the state tries reform, but it's rejected by the populace? It can't work. It's too hard. It's too conservative. It's too controversial. And, and the reform efforts are shot down in the public square. That triggers a scenario we call the jump to the left. The government's going to try and drive reform, but it's not going to get anywhere. As a consequence of that, living standards are going to stagnate. 
And now we're really within, within reach of a 2024 political reversal for the ANC that is going to be slightly shambolic. It's not going to be able to and declining living standards get exploited by some populists to the left of the political spectrum. And South Africa takes a sharp policy turn in that direction. Economically, we're not going to follow the world out of the, out of the COVID uh, uh, crisis. We're not going to follow that global economic recovery. Growth around 0% for a decade because the conflict within policymakers, you can't introduce good ideas, but you also can't force through the bad ones. And uh, that, however, the public frustration that breeds later hijacked by the populists see South Africa in for a very rough 2030s. Unemployment is 40% by 2029, schooling quality deteriorates, living standards stagnate, and 2030s is going to be the, we're going to really reap the whirlwind of that in that decade. Politically, we've remained a free society. Though. The reformers in the ANC are rejected, uh, pushed out of the alliance uh, democratically. The public have rejected the reform offering and said it's not, it's not for them. ANC is going to lose an election at some point in this decade, and South Africa is going to move sharply to the left. Third scenario for us is the fall of South Africa. This one happens where the public mood is indifferent to, to even oppositional uh, to reform, and that is exploited uh, by policymakers who see no need to change track. What to expect in that case is that right off the bat, after COVID, a full spectrum of what's been popularized now as radical economic transformation policies are going to be followed. Government's going to act on its EWC threats, pensions up for grabs, uh, national health insurance on the way. South Africa spends much of the 2020s in recession, debt and deficit takes off, uh, currency through the floor. It's a very rough outcome. Living standards have done badly. Unemployment levels have risen for, to, to average a near 50%. Skills in the middle classes exit both physically the country, their money exits, and they exit into South Africa's enclaves, which will be the sort of uh, fortresses in a sense where the middle classes will hold out through the 2020s and into the 2030s until South Africa's political climate turns. Politically, uh, the liberal democracy is in, is, is suffers uh, some erosion in the face of populist rhetoric. Uh, state capture factions are turning on the reformers and getting the upper hand, and the state capture circle uh, comes uh, full uh, circle. Number four for us is a scenario that we call the step to the right. What happens if the government doesn't drive reforms, but the public demands them? What, what's South Africa's outlook then? In that case, it's an impossible compact that you should expect now from government, the idea that we'll have RET-type policy and reform at the same time. We'll have expropriation and investment together. It just doesn't fly. The investment to GDP data of the past three years makes that clear. 2024, events have overwhelmed the current administration. We're in a political coalition, and out of that coalition, the frustrations don't see South Africa moving a little bit to the political left. They see it moving back to the political center and the political right. Short to medium term, it's going to be a bit rough for South Africa. Debt and deficit, etc., are going to lift. Growth is going to be at a, a fraction of emerging market averages. Living standards are going to slip for through the short to medium term. Unemployment sticks at around 30%. But the public frustrations at a government that does not move is going to see moves through the ballot box that deliver a new administration that leads South Africa to its great uh, uh, potential it's through the late 2020s and into the 2030s. Ultimately, yeah, we've got a rough a couple of years ahead, but we're going to remain a free society. We're going to see a big political realignment this decade. Uh, we're going to have a few years of unstable coalitions, and then we're going to move back to that same centre-right position that uh, South Africa occupied in the early decade, in the, in the first decade of the democracy 
and we'll be able to replicate some of the results we experienced then. We don't think there's a fifth outcome. And what you're all going to go through and as far as you're exposed to South Africa is something you're going to shoehorn into one of these four quadrants. It's not uh, preordained what it's going to be. And as ever, uh, through South Africa's history, much of it now hinges on the extent to which society as a whole can mobilize itself behind demands for deep and far reaching immediate aftermath of COVID give a track that we were Sorry, last Frank? on in that decade to 1994. Sherwin, yes. Uh, sorry, you just lost you for like 10 seconds there. So. Sorry, yeah. Becky. It's at the moment of conclusion, you lose me for 10 seconds. This is the conclusion. Nothing's going to happen in a future South Africa that's not on this game board over here. What you're all going to go through is something you'll later shoehorn into one of these quadrants. None of it is preordained. And as ever in South Africa's history, the case study of the country is such a good one for that. What happens next is, is going to, determine to be determined to a very great extent by the ability of society to mobilize and demand of the sensible structural reforms that are needed to put our country back in the position that it was in in the mid-1990s when it did so much good to stage an economic recovery, uh, create jobs, and uh, meet the demands for a better life for such a great number of its people. That is very much in touch for South, in reach for South Africa still today. COVID still has the potential to be the inflection point for that if the requisite societal demand and activism for reform is in place. And with that, I end for you. Louise, I give this uh, all back to you and your colleague, and we will... Uh, uh, answer some questions a little bit later. Thank you very much for listening to what I've had to say this morning. And I did it in 30 minutes as well. So I'm on time. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Franz Grunian. Whenever I listen to this uh, presentation, I, I, I'm not quite sure how I feel uh, at the end of it. Um, and, uh, and, you know, one hopes, one hopes that the and one hopes that the fact that we have so many property developers and businesses such as BMI Cloverland still investing in South Africa and still seeing opportunity in South Africa, at least within the property sector, um, that we are all hopefully moving towards the rise rather than the floor. And that optimism in the market is what often uh, we mustn't forget. You know, I, when I speak to large corporates and, uh, and see them, staying in the country and continuing to invest in the country uh one does one does feel gratitude especially in these rather nerve-wracking times where where you yeah, know where, where many are cutting and running so thank you so much if there are any questions please feel free to add them to the um chat uh chat box you can uh, we will be bringing out the panel at the end of the last presentation and we can then discuss any questions so uh, with no further ado, I'd like to introduce Hanli van der Waal as our Sub-Saharan Managing Director of BMI Cloverland in South Africa. And we are really here to talk about um, how uh, BMI has taken both their local and international experiences and have come up with a product offering, which is a South African first, and which really does focus on not just the, the developers of our community, uh, large suppliers of resources to our community, but also has ongoing, offers ongoing value to the end user, to those end user investors. So without further ado, um, let us have a look at uh, the new face of BMI Coverland. Over to you, Sherwin. How did we go from that to this? From here to there? From those to these? Was it a change of heart? Or did we just want a change of scene? Three decades of changing lanes, changing gears, changing hands, changing our tune. Yes, this is what 30 years of change looks like. There are some who say that if you don't change, you don't grow, and that without change, there's no future to look forward to. Some say change comes to those who seek it. Others believe it comes on its own. Change is challenge. It makes us laugh and cry. Change is mistakes and lessons. It cannot be resisted. It will not go away. 
Yes, a great deal has changed in the last 30 years. And at BMI Coverland, we understand that the only constant in life is change. But we also know that the one thing we all need is a place to call home. A space of shelter from the winds of change, which is why our roofing solutions are built to last. And that while some things will always change, some should stay the same. Not only are we the biggest and oldest roof tile company in South Africa, we are also part of BMI, the largest roofing and waterproofing company in Europe. Subjected to rigorous testing and quality standards, our roof tiles are designed to prevail. At BMI Coverland, we stand by our quality. BMI stands by our quality. Because it is only quality that withstands the test of time. BMI Coverland's concrete range, guaranteed for 30 years of change. Good morning, everyone. Sean, if you can put up the presentation, please. So again, let's, um, let's get started. Again, good morning to everyone. And today, we as BMI Coverland is proud to launch and introduce into the market our 30-year functional concrete guarantee. Uh, next slide. So during these difficult and trying times that all of us are experiencing and have experienced in the past few months, we are now more than ever realizing the importance of our homes. All of us at work from home or still working from home, we were locked into our homes for a period of time. And our homes are really our shelter, became our safe zone. And it's a place where we feel secure and where we feel comfortable and um, where we can have peace of mind. Next slide. So BMI Coverland prides itself in our promise that we help build communities by providing shelter, protection, and peace of mind through effective and innovative roofing and waterproofing solutions. Together with our customers, our suppliers, and our employees, we are leading the industry in new, efficient, safe, and sustainable ways. Our values are really what guide us to be the business where all our employees is empowered to be the best what they can be. Um, we constantly inspire our customers by what we do and uh, we never stop evolving with our products and that's the reason why we are here today because we will never accept the status quo we will never just continue with what we have but we will continue to evolve and becoming better in what we do and in the systems and solutions that we provide and we are fully connected as one team and we are connecting with all our customers, our suppliers, as well as our employees. And our aim is to drive um, our products, our processes, improve our quality so that we are able to give peace of mind to all our customers around the country. Next slide. So it is therefore no surprise that with 70 years of experience uh, that BMI Coverland is the market leader. And we were established in 1949 and we became the largest concrete roof tile manufacturer in Southern Africa. And what is really important is that we are the only concrete tile manufacturer that has a representation nationally. And therefore, we are able to serve our customers around the country in a much better way than our competitors. 
So we have seven manufacturing concrete tall plants across the country and five sales depots. Our product offering includes local produced concrete range. So there's a, a wide range of various profile concrete tiles that we manufacture. We have an imported clay range, and then we also have a wide variety of components that are used on the roof. And our mission is to continue to deliver high quality roofing solutions, pioneered innovations and world-class service. Next slide. BMI Coverland is also backed by the BMI Group. So we belong to a much bigger group um, around the world. And BMI Group is also a subsidiary of Standard Industry, the largest manufacturer of flat and pitch roofing. And then BMI Group is um, the largest manufacturer of flat and pitch roofing systems in Europe. So with 150 years of experience, we have the backing of a very large group that are able to allow us to provide technical expertise, knowledge and training, um, supporting our customers in any way what is needed. Next slide. So the BMI group was established following the coming together of two very important companies, Brass Monia, which will be known by most of you within the market and around the world as the roofing company, and then Ecopol, which is a waterproofing um, company, the two combined heritage of these two groups represent a rich history of delivering roofing and waterproofing excellence to our customers with uh, more than 30 countries as well as more than 100 manufacturing facilities around the globe. Next one, slide. What is really great and that should be able to give you peace of mind is that we also have a technical center who is providing um, technology testing and well, it was established um, over the years with more than 120 people in various locations with specialized skills and knowledge. And this will provide peace of mind when it comes to your roofing, knowing that it consists of the best quality tested and guaranteed products. Next slide. Your peace of mind, our guarantee can provide that peace of mind. So the 30 year functional concrete guarantee is valid for 30 years. I mean, it's a long period of time and that will be able to provide you peace of mind. It covers damage to weather resistance of the product resulting from a manufacturing defect. It's affected from the date of completion of installation. And of course, as always, um, there's also T's and C's that apply. So the installation has to be done in accordance with BMI Coverland technical specifications, as well as the national building regulations. And again, this will also give you peace of mind knowing that what is on your roof is not only guaranteed, 
but it has to follow specific processes and procedures. And it's subject to a roof inspection and then a sign off. Um, and these T's, C, T's and C's are also available on our website or from the sales representative in your specific area. And on a very positive note, um, should you sell your house or the property being transferred, then the guaranteed uh, will be transferred as well. Next slide. So as you have seen from the short video clip, that a lot can change in 30 years, but your roof doesn't have to. Um, and with a 30 year guarantee, you can have peace of mind no matter what change, because it's never just a roof. So Louise, I think um, it's now time for questions. Yes, thank you so much, Hanali. So very, a very interesting product and, and, and what we've been saying a lot is the South African first. Um, the, there's been a few questions that are popping up in our uh, Q&A side and I, I thought I'll just uh, maybe ask you the burning question, which I'm sure is on everybody's minds. Um, how much will, by what will the guarantee affect the price of the product? Yes, let me, let me answer that one. And um, I want to, by the outset, just say that our pricing is um, linked and it's governed by various factors. So it depends on the quantity that you buy. It depends on the specific profile that you buy. And we are linking our price uh, together with a customer that's buying and the relationship that we have with a customer. And again, um, I would think that this guarantee giving you peace of mind, knowing that for at least 30 years you are covered and that you have the backing, that our customers would also be willing to pay more to have that peace of mind. Um, you know, we, we've mentioned uh, a, a lot about the word functional guarantee. Um, how does this differ? What is it? What is a functional guarantee? Maybe you can just define it a little bit for us. Let me jump in there. Ah, the... Willem, thank you. <laughs> yes, yeah, so you know, a roof tile is there to provide shelter. Um, and as um, um, Hanley stated in the in the in the, the pre ultimate slide, you know it's about weather resistance. So you don't want you know water coming or rain coming into your to your roof or leaking and that. So the our tiles are designed with uh, weather channels, and so the water can run off, and to make sure that your roof stays dry inside. So the functional element comes in that your your um, your roof will perform its function is to keep you safe and dry uh, and provide shelter so that's where the functional element comes in so it, it will do what it's meant to do for 30 years so so uh, maybe just to stay with you if if that is the case then would the, once the installation has occurred, would a BMI specialist then be brought out to sign off that installation? Or would the project manager uh, representing the development company be able to sign off on the installation? We would do a combination of the two. So to make sure that, I mean, most of our, our representatives are out there, you know, with their customers in any case. So just to make sure that you know, even from a development point of view, those guys need to sign it off. But from our side as well, to make sure that that we are happy that it con that it uh, comply to our specifications as per our, our technical uh, technical manual. But Just our customers work closely with us on those in any case. So, mm -hmm. which is which is always good. Just a question from the audience: uh, Nico van Rensburg's asking us. 
how will that guarantee transfer from a retailer to an end user? Well, it's still an end user that will have a, a product installed. So somebody has to in install that roof. So as when it is installed uh, at, 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 a, at the development or at a person's home uh, and they want to register for, for the guarantee, which they can do, um, we will need to get someone out to go and, and check the roof because you don't want a, a roof in a certain areas where there's, you know, there's uh, that poor, for poor workmanship and, the, and the, the, the roof structure is not done, is done correctly and which will then affect the, the, the performance of our product. So you want to make sure that the roof is installed as per the regulations. Uh, which also back then ensures that the, the roof will perform as it should uh, for mm -hmm. 30 years. Louise, maybe if I can, if I can jump in there, um, the end users, so the person that owns the house, eventually the guarantee will be issued to him because um, your developer or your retailer might you know, over time disappear or no longer exist. And then it's really your homeowner that stays in the home that has to claim against the guarantee should the need be. Yes. So, so there, so, uh, you know, just to answer Edward's question that's coming up and I think we've answered it in part. Um, he was asking about a registration process. Um, I take it that there is a process then. These are, once you've in, done your installation, um, you then would contact your local supplier or branch and they would then do the, the give hand over that registration to you and then you pass that on to your, when you resell your property or whatever that, that might be. Um, a question though is if we have, um, if a, a question coming in, if, if you've already invested uh, recently during the course of 2019 or 2020, we've made use of the, the concrete tile on a, on, a, on a development, can the guarantee be backdated? Are we, um, or is it for future works only? Yeah, so it's not backdated. Uh, so the guarantee is basically launched today. So people can register for the guarantee as of completions that are done as of today. Um, it doesn't mean we, we, we don't back our products beforehand. Um, there's always merit in, in, in um, checking products if, you know, if there are any issues. And, and we stand by our products, we stand by our quality in any case. So we will endeavor to, to, uh, to assist customers who have existing roofs in the market already. Uh, we have a question coming in again from our panel, uh, from our audience. Richie's asking if this is the first in South Africa, and we know this is, are we saying that no other um, roof tile manufacturer offers a guarantee, a functional absolutely. guarantee? Yes, absolutely. There is no other concrete tile manufacturer that offers this guarantee. So it's a first. And um, again, I think it's no surprise that as the market leader, we are the ones that's introducing this in the market. That's fantastic. And I, and I think that it's very important to highlight that this guarantee that you've launched is, is really come into play due to uh, an, uh, the amount of uh, international local experts that you have as part of the group. And you're able to see this. And, and as, as um, community specialists, to state living, we, we see the value being able to be passed on to that, that end user, to that homeowner. Uh, you know, when, when you're selling your, when you're, you know, marketing your development and understanding that the, garret, the roof has a lifespan on it uh, and there's a guarantee in place is an important attribute as power or any other, other type of facility that could be offered by a, by a, by a developer. Uh, just to you know, sort of add to that, the the timing around the guarantees. So uh, the installation has happened. We've got somebody out, and we've now received the guarantee. What does that timeline look like? I think it all depends on how quickly we get to site, um, but it it will be issued uh, as quick as possible. I mean, there's there's no reason why there should be months and months and months of delays. It could be done in a day or in, you know, in the morning, depending on 
on how quickly someone's at site. As soon as someone's been to site, uh, a guarantee issue can be can be placed or can be handed to a customer. Um, I think you touched on this uh, this answer a little bit earlier when we were talking about what the guarantee included. Um, is there anything that the guarantee would not include? Yes, for sure. And I mean, we said this during the presentation as well, that it has to be installed in line with our laying practices, our rules, our regulations, the same as with the Building Institute. So for instance, if it's not laid correctly on the roof and not as per requirements and something should happen or the tile should break uh, or it would leak, then this guarantee would not cover that. Or if there's a lot of um, walking on the roof, unnecessary walking on the roof with uh, heavy materials or heavy equipment, or when other equipment is installed on the roof, for instance, solar panels or anything else that is not in line with our practices, then that will not be covered under the guarantee. These items, the, the, the installation process um, would obviously be covered when that inspector comes out. So if, are we saying that if there is a change to that roof so once it's installed it's inspected and the guarantees issued should there be any changes to that roof structure at any time you would then need to bring out the team again to inspect and sign off on the guarantee is that correct absolutely. yes yeah. um, tricky in our audience is asking us a question um and it's, she's asking or he's asking how will the guarantee um deal with the issues between product versus installation and the and the gray areas around the responsibility she said this seems to be a recurring issue within the construction industry um so the, and i'm not quite sure what she's she's asking but i'm assuming if the guarantee is on the product is the guarantee the installation would that have a guarantee as well i'm sorry i'm, I'm just trying to maybe you've got a better understanding of that question than than i do yeah, yeah. i think i think that, that that's what i alluded to earlier is that you you might have the, the substructure of the of of the the roof plays and plays a role in in the in the in the performance of the roof as well the thing is if it's lay if the if the roof is is erected as per the national building regulations and according to our which merges very closely with with our specifications the product should be should perform as it should it's where it happens where you have um, people installing the roof so the substructure the trusses uh, and that is not done according to specification you will have sort of sagging on roofs and issues with with the with the quality of, of of the actual performance of the roof and i think that's where the gray area comes in so if you have a, a recognized installer uh, that has all the that, that ticks all the boxes uh, you should not have an issue uh, with that roof i mean your roof is in in any case your your structure there's there's an onus on the developer or the installer of that roof for a certain period of time as well um, that they need to make sure that the roof is installed correctly. Um, mm. We as say our concrete products will perform its 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 job uh, according to to the specification, um, but it's, it works as a system as well. So, have, thank you. We have quite a good question from Nico as well. He's asking um, on a large scale uh, development uh, where they've exclusively used the product. Um, does each an individual homeowner need to register their individual roof, um, or could the is the are the roofs collectively registered by the developer? Yeah, I think on, on that case it would probably be the from a development point of view, which is then passed on to the to the relevant homeowners. Like a central development, um, who has multi-story units, so that will almost sit with the developer as such. You can't filter that down to all the little 
units under you know underneath that. Uh, but it's something we can we can uh, talk to you about. You know, talk to the the, the teams so about. An, the so on an individual oh, case, the yeah. person the because I mean, if some of the footage that we looked at in your video, we can see uh, those beautiful developments in Johannesburg that you've done, and there the the number of units in that particular development exceeds 400. So does each homeowner yeah. then register? Though, though that's something that would be discussed project yeah. by project. Um, yeah. I have another scenario uh, from uh, Yaku, who's asking um, if in year 29, the roof tiles are found to be brittle and causing leaks into uh, property. What is the process and what costs would not be covered by BMI? For example, the transport and labor of replacing and removing tiles. Uh, are the transport and labor covered um, if we, if the guarantee comes into place? If it comes into play, yes. We will cover the, the, the cost mm -hmm. of replacing the product so that the roof is back to, or the, the product is back to its original state that it should have been. Um, our, our products, I mean, we've got, like we say, 70 years of, of, uh, of expertise already in the, in the local market and also the backing of, of our technical center. And I mean, there, should, there should be no reason, uh, based on the way we produce our products, uh, that a towel will go brittle after 30 years or 40 years or 50 years. Uh, so that tiles will get, that go, will go brittle because of an issue in the manufacturing process, not because of, uh, not, and that's not the way we produce our, our tiles. And that's yeah. why our tiles are backed and they're tested for that length of time by our technical center. Um, so we, we can come, we come and say, yeah, our tiles are backed for that 30 years. Excellent. Um, so just a question actually for Dr. France, um, uh, just before we um, finish up, one of the earlier questions asked after we, we saw all three of, or four of the scenarios, and I think this comes into play, will we, will we need our 30 year guarantee? Um, <laughs> the, 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 the question is, Dr. Dr. France, can you, which scenario do you see? And I'm sure you've been asked this question a lot. Which scenario for South Africa do you see playing out in the future? Well, well more than ever, you'll need your guarantee. Yeah, um, well, more than ever, the, yes, exactly. <laughs> the, um, yeah, here's the answer. Give, give me three minutes and I'll answer the question. But the context is important. I, I think you, one or two of you who've seen me before might have heard this story, but here, here it is. Suspend disbelief for five minutes, three minutes with me. And imagine that uh, today is the 16th of August, 1985. Um, and some of you if, you, if you're old enough, you know what happened last night. I can remember it as a child listening. I grew up in a very political household, so I can remember. And what happened last night is that uh, Pierre Villaguerta went to Durban to deliver a speech to the National Party that became famous as the Rubicon speech. And he said, and this is a direct quote, that I will not lead white South Africa down the path of abdication and suicide. And the context was um, mad. The economy was in deep recession. Uh, deficits were blown out. The Cold War was on the go. Liberation movements locked up in exile, Mr. Mandela in prison. Uh, um, if wars on the front line states, uh, white conscripts fighting black activists across the country. And the, this is the line. We will not reform. We're not going to change to hell with you. And if an analyst in my role spoke to you the next morning and said to you, yeah, you know, sure, that's what it looks like. But within a decade, what can happen here is that the last leader of the National Party might become the tourism minister in an ANC cabinet that will take the rate of growth back to 5% and govern with a budget surplus within a decade, which is what they did. You would have thought me mad. 
and you would have thought it can't be and it won't be and this chap is just it but it happened and it's it's not the exception it, it really isn't we this is what we do in in the center we put our clients in a position where there are no surprises and a lot of that job now is to convince them of upsides because many of them don't see it if you were in the civil rights movement in america in the 1960s and uh, and someone said to you then and you, if you're familiar with that history that within your lifetime there'll be a black man in the white house they would have said no it's not and if you then attended mr obama's inauguration if you stood in the mall in washington and if you've been there you'll know what a impressive coliseum it is there were a million people there and he made that famous yes we can speech and you turned to your mates and said you know the next guy to stand there's going to be donald trump <laughs> would have said it's absolutely now now it's too much now it's too much the 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 circumstances now assembled in south africa are two are very really important one is the government has run out of rope if it does not turn to reform now the odds of it remaining in power indefinitely are are not good and that is appreciated even within the ANC you wouldn't know it from reading a newspaper but i assure you it's the case the second thing is that public opinion in south africa is is very moderate and very magnanimous and contrary to what you read on twitter or in newspapers Uh, we poll a lot so it's easy to see good 7 to 8 out of 10 south africans have great respect for each other and they want the same thing they all want one thing they want to leave rural areas and come to cities they want to put their kids in good schools they want their kids to have better lives than they had they want a job so they can look after themselves just the dignity of earning an income and they want to accumulate property and most often a home which will need a roof so you're in you're in a good business there and um should it be the case that the current government does not reform then for me now the outlook is that we will see a political realignment and that will move south africa back to the center right should that not happen the chief thing stopping it is that there will be a reform movement emerging out of this government So you know take it from us and if you're familiar with us if you read a bit about us you know we're not the good news guys we 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 were hawks and we guard that reputation jealously we are our uh, cold clinical analysts um we're not swayed by external pressures or interests so we totally independent I think the 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 uh, I would be very surprised if going into the end of this decade and into the 2030s South Africa was not a fundamentally better society than the one that it has risked becoming over recent years. So there's my answer to you. Top left is probably where I lean on the scenarios now uh in that quadrant. So that's that's my answer head on a block you'll hold me accountable for it. I'm sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you so very much Dr. Franz Krenier for for that and thank you so much Hanali and uh, Willem for joining us as well today. Um and more importantly, thank you for BMI's um understanding of the market and 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 investment and being able to invest in what future developments are going to be taking off and they certainly if you speak to property developers from both the retail commercial and residential sectors um there are definitely there's an appetite for risk still and um and the folks are definitely looking to 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 invest and roll out uh, developments integrated developments coming in at various price points So thank you to everybody who attended. Um this recording will be available on the Estate Living's website and BMI Globalands website and we'll be sharing it over the coming weeks um so that we can also share the the good news. Thank you so much to everybody and uh, and and enjoy the rest of this sunny uh Cape Town uh Thursday and I hope it's I hope everyone has a a great day and thank you again for coming.